Ren Ballet spent over a decade in bands, including Adelaide Americana outfit The Hegarty's, and she is now a solo artist, releasing her rich album This Love Will Die a few weeks ago. We are going to talk about her musical life and the album, which is wonderful. Hello, Ren. Hello. <laughs> Great to see you live on Zoom, but also be recorded on Zoom for people watching and listening. Um, I was interested to see that all the songs on the album were written by you alone. Have you always been a solo songwriter? Um, yes and no. Um, it's kind of, I, I don't think anyone can ever really be a, a complete songwriter all by themselves because the minute you get anybody else in to play it with you, they're automatically going to suggest something or it changes in some way. So for me to say I did 100% of everything in these songs, that would be untrue. Um, uh, but, yeah, the the essence, the, the structure, the songs, the lyrics, they are mine. I'd say where the things have changed are probably the arrangements. But, yeah, these are my songs. <laughs> and it raises an interesting point, what you've just said, which is, mm. At which marker do you say or someone else has contributed to this song? Uh, yeah. I suppose when you're when you've got a band and you're going to play live and you're rehearsing, then things change there as well. And you know, going absolutely to does. It absolutely does. And like um, some of these songs, I play them because I've had different lineups and at times, you know, I'll play a song and then I'll go go to a different chord and I'll be like, oh, that was that was Jamie's chord. He liked that chord, you know. <laughs> I still have it in my mind. So. Definitely, a lot of people were involved in in these songs. You know, I think, and I think that's why they're great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. They are great. But I also tend to think, yeah, when you're the songwriter, the other people can make adjustments, but of course, they wouldn't be able to do that if you hadn't provided the song. So yeah, it's it's always that interesting, not a grey area that makes it sound bad, but you know what I mean. Like it's it's yeah. an interesting area to explore. I think that what I do with it, just to sorry, go back on this again. Um, is I don't go to the band and go, okay, this is what I think. Let can you help me or can we do this or I need what do you want to do? It's like I'll 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 play it, mm. and then often it's like they might begin their part or they will do their part. It's just more of a, 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 a there's an evolution there to how it sort of comes about, um, and I think that's probably why I can I feel it's not a collaborative thing as we all get together and write a song as a group, which is. I haven't actually ever had the opportunity to do it, to be honest. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, mm. Has there ever been a time when they have contributed something and you thought, oh, no, I don't like that at all? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but you, yeah, because it, it, and sometimes, like, there's this song on the album called Come Back Home and um, I wrote it and it's a really simple song on guitar. Um, and when I brought it to the the first lineup that I had, they would, these guys were sort of like, yeah, let's do this and let's do that. And it, in all honesty, like I look back, I listen to it, that arrangement back now and it's, it's kind of funny because of just how completely off the track it was in comparison to the actual song itself. And then we went to the studio and it was Tasha Coates. It was like, mm -mm, I don't think this song has been arranged properly. And we just completely took away the original arrangement and started again. And um, com a completely different song. And, but the chorus is exactly the same. The vert, all of the, it's the incidentals that are different around it, effectively. But, yeah, it's really hard when that happens to be like, mm, not sure about it. Well, yeah, I suppose because these are people that you know well, you're playing with them on stage, and, and it, it would be hard to say, hey, I, I don't agree because there are mm. all sorts of implications. You know, people have yeah. egos. Yeah, yeah, it's tricky. It's uh, it is a tricky thing to do. Um, I, I, for the most part, it's been pretty good. There's been a couple of things where, and then there's a, a matter of you go calling your battles. You know, like which ones the important things to to get stuffy about, and funny about, and what's what really matters and what really doesn't. But uh, it's not nothing particularly. Not, I think come back home was the real kicker. Actually, the one that was completely wrong in comparison to how it ended up. I suppose it's also part of the process of taking a work that's been yours, you've written it, you've had it to yourself, and then it's going out to the world to an audience. So this is almost like the, the gestation and then the birth of it going through all these different hands yeah. with their interpretations. That's exactly right. Like it's so, I when I, <laughs> I've become a little bit, a bit of a snob about this one particular thing that irks me excessively. It's like I when I go to a venue and I see a band or I see a musician and they get up and they go oh, I wrote this song yesterday I'm like I don't want to hear it 
I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. It's not ready. You won't even know what you're doing. You'll forget halfway through. And I get it. Like, I know how excited you are when you've first written a song. It's like, oh, I love it. I want to play it. I understand that. But it's like, I, in my, my arrogant opinion, I genuinely let the song live. Let it have its life because it will change, you know. Um, yeah. And I, that just, that's the thing. A song can take so long to eventually to become and it can live so many different lives and it's and you know it's not until you record it that you decide that's it that's what it looks like you know because once it's down there it's you can do variations of it but that is that's that's it it's done yeah. <laughs> so yeah I wouldn't say it's an arrogant opinion you obviously have experience and, and <laughs> you got the experience as a creator as well as a listener that's the thing I did yeah I feel a little bit I don't know, maybe I'm just old and crank, cranky. <laughs> but I kind of like, I, I have an expectation when I go see people. I love, I love seeing other musicians, but I also kind of have an expectation of they want them to, you know, I know how hard I work before I get up and do it. And I kind of want to have, be given the same respect from an audience perspective. So, you know, I think, this, I think people, I, I <laughs> it's controversial. Um, I feel like, the people are taking their time to come and see you. There's so many other things that they could see. They are giving you, they are affording you that time and respect. And I genuinely believe that you need to be, you need to, that you need to warrant that. Your what you do needs to warrant their that time that they've put into you. And so yeah, I'm like, mm, that stuff gets to me. <laughs> well, if that's a controversial opinion, I don't think it should be because I think that's absolutely what the game is. You know, like it, it's you've got to pay the compliment to the audience, and I'm of the same belief because yeah, like they're showing up, they're giving you their time far more than money. They're actually giving you time and attention. They are, and you know, when you first go and you see somebody like you know, when you're when you're on stage and you see everyone's faces and they've never seen you before, and there's that certain look that everybody has in their on their face. It's almost like a you can see that that some are like have got their ideas of what they're going to see and they're excited or they're you know a bit confused or whatever. But for the most part, most people sort of have a like, okay, I'm open to the experience. You know, show me what what enlighten me or give it to me. Hmm. <laughs> it's like they've kind of got that open look about themselves. They're, so they really are opening themselves up, yeah, and they're trusting you with that to 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 warrant it. And it's that's why we feel disappointed when we come away. We're like, dang, you know. Wish they, I wish they had. That's 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 my feeling as a as a punter. But yeah, so that's ultimately what I try and do. Like I, um, I've stopped and I've I've been I've done it myself. You know, I'm so excited to play a song. I'm like, let's throw it, let's play this song. You know, um, but also I feel like the minute you start performing it, when it's not fully written, I think it's almost like you've you stunt its growth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Well, because mm. there's a lot to be said for an editorial process. Oh my god, there is there is so much in an editorial process, and that's often. I'm kind of I'm I'm just listening to myself in 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 horror right now, but whatever. Um, I think that that is that's probably the hardest part and the most important part because you can people can write this most you know incredible thing, but um, was it always like that to begin with? Do how much have people needed to? cut and tidy it up and, and simplify it and make sure that they're not over convoluting stuff. And like when lyrics don't, when people shove lyrics in that don't fit in the, in the melodic pattern because they really love that line and they love it so much, but melodically it doesn't fit. It's like you have to, you have to be, have to say goodbye to that line, find another way around it, but you can't just shove it in there hoping it will work. And yeah, these are all my little, songwriter grimes which I didn't realize I had so many I'm really opinionated this afternoon but which is fantastic because but also you've been you've been writing songs for a while like it's and you've and you've been performing and that's the other thing so the editorial process is not just oh I've been in a garret writing songs and and maybe I have an opinion about it. it's actually I've written songs I've taken them through an editorial process I have taken them to the people and mm. I've seen how they work. And so that's that's actually that whole, it's, that's the end-to-end -end process. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, and I think that's why I like it. Um, so I'm not by any means comparing myself, but I just thought it was an interesting thing that she said. But like with Chapel Rowan, she, you know, she's come out, she's incredible, and people are like, oh my God, she's amazing. Um, and she is amazing, and I just love her so much. 
But I think it's really interesting watching a video of her playing, you know, Pink Pony Club at the market somewhere and she's got a little keyboard and, you know, this is like half a dozen uninterested people. And I, and she's been, you know, she wrote that song years ago. And it's like, yeah, and she's been working that song up and it's changed and it's moved from one place to the other. So it's, it's really is like, I do think, like I'm, just, I play my, I'm, I'm still playing my songs. I'm like, God, I'm still playing this buddy song. But I, it takes, a, they just they just take a long time to to really get to where they hopefully will eventually land. And I, yeah, it, it's all about the edit, I think, to be honest. Once you get the first bit in, you've got to be prepared to be, you know, to edit it up and let go of parts that you like if you just, if they just don't work. Yeah, and being open to that process, which can be really hard, you know. It's, it's yeah. not easy to get feedback. It's not easy to... Yeah. And and what well, and some of that feedback comes from the audience, right? You can be there performing, oh, yeah. and reacting <laughs> yeah. the way you want them to. And, yeah, and also like it's it's really hard to let go of a song that just no matter how hard you try, it just doesn't land. But there's parts of it that you love. Mm-hmm. So I've written songs where I'm like, oh, I love the chorus so much, but I can't get you know a verse to go with it, or I just can't I can't move it along a part past a certain point. And then you think, oh well, I'll use that chorus somewhere else. And the, I have not mastered that. I think there's maybe one song, two potentially, where I've grabbed bits and shoved into other bits. But for the most part, I've not been able to cut and paste any songs. So if you've got a song that's got a great chorus, but the rest of it sucks, you just have to let it go. And it's hard because you know that you get there goes that one chorus that you'll never get to use again. Yeah. And I tried to cut them and make them work and it just doesn't do, doesn't work. <laughs> I suppose you know, if, you, if you want to try to feel better about it, it's like, well, I had to I had to write that great chorus in order to then come up with some other songs, which I'm really happy with. So that's sure. the chorus's purpose was to move me along <laughs> with something else. Yeah. It is a, it is a truth about um, opening up, like uh, getting yourself into a headspace where you're going to like, oh, I'm, I'm actually going to write a song. Like I'm going to write it. I'm going to put my energy into it. And then you have, you know, you sometimes you get lucky and you'll be like, wow, that happened really quickly. And other times, you know, you, you might write three or four duds before you get to the song that you want to get to. And it's a journey just to, uh, to get that, to go through that period and, and to be able to go, no, nah, it's kind of not sticking. You know, it's not, um, yeah, yeah. and then you've got your friends and family around you're like hey I've got this new song and you play it and they're like yeah it's fine <laughs> you're like oh okay what so, do you yeah. know, <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. they're like yeah it's all right and you're like oh, okay fair <laughs> Well, now on the album, This Love Will Die, there are no duds. So clearly the editorial mm. process works. But it, the title of the album could be seen as gloomy because it forecasts the end of a love. But I, I, it was definitely not a miserable album. It was quite the opposite. Nah, so I'm wondering if you had a mood in mind when you started writing for it. Yeah. Um, so the album kind of didn't, I didn't actually intend to write this heartbreak album. Um, I intend, I was basically, we're just, COVID was kicking in and, you know, my, I think I'd been separated for about two years by that stage and I was just writing stuff, stuff at home. Um, but because gigs are drying up because of COVID, I was thinking, oh, I'm just going to go into the studio and put some songs down. And I had no real plan about what that would look like. I wasn't even sure if I was going to write an album. Um, and then we, we recorded Woman, uh, don't Die Young and Love Song in the first batch of recordings. And they they just came up really well, um, which surprised me. Uh, and it just, and then I'm like, I don't want to throw these songs away on an EP or a, or whatever. So I eventually started thinking, all right, I'm just going to, maybe I think I'm just going to record an album. Um, and we, uh, so Tasha Coates is a mate of mine and she's um, from the Audrey's and she'd been offering to produce an album for me for a while and she'd say it and I always think she was just you know doing stuff talking rubbish <laughs> so I didn't take her up on it but she was insistent and eventually I'm like yeah I think I actually would like to so we kind of just went into the studio with an idea of recording a couple of songs and just not no real plan for them um we applied for some some music grants through South Australian music which we didn't get <laughs> and um and I had a decent job at that point. So I just thought, I don't want to waste these songs on an EP. I think I'm just going to keep on recording. Um, so I decided I was going to write an album. 
uh, and and I made the choice. Initially, I was thinking I'm just going to make it best, my best works, like most people put on an album, your best works. But what I liked about the process, which I allowed myself, was to say I'm going to give myself space because I'm going to record these in sections to write new stuff if new stuff comes along the journey. Right. And that's actually what happened. Um, so about two-thirds of the way through, um, we'd recorded a fair few. And by about that point, I started to go, oh, dang it, I think I'm writing a heartbreak album. Uh-huh. <laughs> I really, and I wasn't sure I wanted to because it was a bit too raw still. Right. And we'd recorded seven songs by that point. <laughs> Um, and there was a song called One Man's Trash and just the way it just wasn't quite right um, for it. But we were like, okay, I think we have to, I think I'm recording an album. This is what I'm doing. Like I, it was more like I just had to acknowledge what I was subconsciously doing because I was 100% doing that, but I hadn't really admitted it to myself. Um, and then I spoke to my daughter about it and I'm like, I think I'm recording this. Like I think it's a, it, it wasn't like something I made the decision to do. It kind of happened to me, if that makes sense. Mm. And then I'm thinking, what can I call it? Like what should I call it? Like, you know, it's got to be like some sort of heartbreaky thing. And with my daughter, Riley, he said, you should call it. It's on my, one of the songs that you've got, which is This Love Will Die. And it was, it was like, oh, my God, that's right. It's perfect. <laughs> it's so perfect. Because as you said earlier, it's actually, even though it's gloomy and it's painful, it's actually optimistic. Mm. If you're someone who loves someone who has left you and you have to get through that, it's actually a this too shall pass moment. It's a, yeah, this love will die. You will get past this point. Um, And that from that point, I was, it was easier because I knew what I was doing. I was like, I'm writing this. So then I wrote two other songs that um, didn't exist before I started recording the album and that was um, Too Late Now and Road Less Travelled. So Road Less Travelled didn't even exist before I started recording this album. And, yeah, and because I was able to give myself, because I was forced to financially because I didn't have people throwing money at me, I I had time to be able to write new stuff. And to be able to write Road Less Travelled with, to, write, to start, start start on this song and then going, oh, my God, this is, this is my final track. Like, I've never experienced that before. Like, other people may have, but to be able to go, oh, this track is the final track. This is about the journey that I'm about to go on. So all of the stories were about what's happened and all the things that have occurred. But then this Road Less Travelled is a song that plays out at the end and it doesn't, even though it keeps on building, even though it's fading away, to the volumes fading away as it fades away, what's actually happening? Like the guitar soloist at the very end, Tom Kneebone, he's like, Wee! he's like going off doing this crazy guitar solo because it's like the journey isn't going to finish. It's just mm-hmm. going to keep on going. So that was kind of... Yeah, the whole, the album just sort of happened, to be honest. I didn't intend to write it. It just kind of made its way into the universe. Because <laughs> yeah. when you were saying that, you know, you were insistent that you, you know, this wasn't going to be an album and subliminally, mm. though, you think it was, was it that because previously you'd been in bands and now as a solo artist, it was, there was something in you that understood that it, it was going to be really vulnerable and exposing to have a full album of songs that are about you. Yeah. Exactly that. And to be honest, one of the things that I, it's it's ironic to say this, but I had to question myself, am I going to be able to do interviews about this? Am I going to be able to talk about this stuff? Um, And earlier on, I I had a couple of interviews that were done while I was recording it and they were awful (laughs) because I obviously wasn't ready for it. And they'd ask me questions and I'd kind of be like, oh, I don't know, what do you think? Um, <laughs> so it has, it has, it, it definitely wasn't, it's it's very exposing, you know, the album tells, tells it what it is. But what is really interesting is that I honestly didn't realise how cathartic music was. Right. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I know. You hear all that stuff, but to actually be like that song, Come Back Home, was probably one of the was hands down the hardest song I've ever written. Mm-hmm. Um, not it wasn't hard to 
to write, it actually fell out. It was easy to write, but it was hard to, to sing because it was em embarrassingly honest. And the, the part in the line of the end of the chorus, which is, you've left me waiting, waiting for you to come back home, was really hard to admit that to myself, that even a year after we'd broken up and after all the theatrics of me going, don't you come back and blah, 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 underneath all of it, I was still honestly waiting for him to come back home. Right. And when I wrote it, I'm finishing off the chorus and I'm kind of getting to it and I'm like, and then you've left me waiting for you. And then it, the word literally came out of my mouth, come back home. And I just stopped and just sobbed because it was like, oh, my God, this is true. I've never, ever experienced anything like that as a songwriter where it's almost like your subconscious just spills it out for you. Mm -hmm. And it was confronting for me to play that song because I was it was it, it was really, really confronting. And so for ages. But we get to the band, I'd be like, OK, guys, I'm, I'm not I could cry, but we'll see how we go. <laughs> So it, it took me, it was a really hard song to sing and perform, but without, you know, within a year or two, it's fine. <laughs> now I can do it without any problem. And, you know, now I enjoy it and it doesn't cause me pain and all of those things. So I think that that's some part of the beautiful thing about songwriting and music is that it actually is a healing thing for many people. <laughs> well, I think partly why that line might have been so confronting is that it, it, it can be hard to admit to having hope. You know, it can it can yeah. seem not, not cool, particularly in exactly. that context. It's like, yeah. oh, well, if someone's left and, and you really want them back, then then culturally the onus is on you to pretend that, like, everything's fine and you don't yeah. care. That's right. But having That's hope, right. which is actually not something you can prevent, right? It's it's not. Yeah. It's something that just that it's you just... feel <laughs> can't help but you know it's exactly right that's exactly and that's why the end of that song that's like I've been doing all the right things to keep my head held high like I'm I've been you know I've been doing all the things to keep myself looking good over here yeah <clears throat> it was a tricky a tricky song that one but I really yeah it's one of my favorites <laughs> it's an interesting one but yeah really good for uh getting me through all of this which has been surprising <laughs> yeah. well and then therefore you know the role of art uh, for the creator as well as for the listener, because no doubt it will, will, have, will have helped some people who've listened to it manage their own situations. Oh, thank, uh, I would love to think that, Sophie. It's um, that actually, so prior to writing my own stuff in my own band, I was in a band with my husband for years, and the songs that I wrote were, were, always, were always third person wow. because I can't write about my relationship in a band with the husband that's in the same band with me, you know. I can't. And so I used to write stuff that was in, inadvertently about us, but I'd frame it so it was about somebody else or I wouldn't even realise I was writing that, like that song, li Lying to Myself. I had written that as a third, per third, per third person story. It's absolutely 100% about me, but I didn't really fully own that when I was writing it. Um, but, yeah, so the point is I was always very third party and it was always like Some, this is somebody else's and this is somebody else's. And I think I went away and went to Nashville and saw um, went to the Americana Festival there and just saw some amazing musicians. And I actually, the thing I got away from that was coming back and going, if I actually seriously want to call myself a songwriter, I'm just going to have to be, take, take, you know, be ballsy and actually sing songs about myself because... Mm -hmm that's that is actually a part of what a songwriter does we don't just write tracks because it's fun otherwise they'd just be commercials and jingles mm -hmm. you know song yeah. is, do you feel like it's a responsibility of a songwriter because we you're using the form of music which is precious I feel like it it's it, it's a place where you want to be honest and talk about yourself and for those very reasons that I think about how many times I have looked up a track and, oh, that's what I want to listen to because that person speaks to me right now for all the things that I'm going through. Mm -hmm. I've, and I have gained my entire life so much from that experience, right. from those musicians, that for me to call myself a songwriter and just to back out and be a gutless coward and not actually sing about the stuff that is truthful 
I don't I just don't think I could have come up until that point I don't think I really was a proper songwriter until I was prepared to be vulnerable and go this is my crap <laughs> have a listen to it <laughs> so in in general though when did you start writing songs was it when you first joined a band and you were like well I need to come up with some material or did it start before that yeah so um so my husband and I he he'd, he basically started the band and he was putting a band together and he was like you know what if you want to you can join you can do some backing vocals and that to me was very confronting because I was like okay <laughs> I hadn't performed or anything I hadn't been a musician I hadn't considered myself a musician so we started doing that and I was in Initially, I hated it, but then eventually I started to enjoy it. So I started to get better at vocals and stuff. And, and at that point, we were just a covers band. We were just doing Americana covers in Adelaide for fun, really. Um, and then, you know, he started to go, oh, if you want to, this is a Listen to Williams song. Would you like to sing it? And we're like, oh, I'd love to. So over time, I started to sing more and more songs. Um, and that and eventually in, in a set, I was probably singing about four or five of them and he would sing the majority. Um, but then what would happen, like that was maybe two or three years had passed and, you know, in Adelaide, we were sort of getting a following even though we were a covers band and people would be like, when are you bringing out your album and when's your music? And I'm like, well, we are a covers band. Like you do get that. <laughs> um, <laughs> like I'm not sure, I don't think Ryan Adams would really call that as re doing one of his covers. Um, so, but there were all these musicians, there's songwriters in the band. There was like three, four songwriters already in the band, but no one was really kind of doing it. And I had some leave from work, I had like three months, and I think I just said to myself, I'm going to see if I can write a country song. And I didn't. <laughs> but like you were saying earlier, I, I tried, and it was that process of just like getting the cogs turning, like the wheels turning. Um, and just like, just, just to go back a little bit as a kid, um, I would sit in the backseat of my mum's car and she, my sister and I were a twin sister and we we're both singers. Um, and we didn't have a stereo. So we would sit in the back of mum's Kingswood without seatbelts on, on cushions <laughs> and we would make up songs. Right. We did it all the time and it was right. just normal. We'd just make up songs and we'd make up songs all together. And at that moment in my life, when I was driving to work, you know, fast forward 40 years or 30 something years, um, I'm driving to work and my stereo was bust. And so I was actually almost back where I was, like driving around. And so I kind of just, I think I must have just subconsciously tapped into that experience of being a kid. And I just started singing like I used to and writing lyrics as I'm singing the songs and coming up with the ideas. So the first one that was Ever, the first song I probably, the first song I actually ever wrote was a song called Alice. And I was, you know, I, I remember coming home one day after work and going to my, to Paul, my ex-husband, going, um, I, I think I have a song. <laughs> and he was like, okay, sure, right. He didn't know I was trying to do it. Um, he got his guitar and he said, all right, start singing. Show, show me what it was. And Honestly, I don't think I've ever experienced that kind of nerve nervousness, but like I felt so exposed, like it's nothing I've ever experienced. Like it's the weirdest thing to go, this is something I made up, you know. Um, but he was great. And he just he's like, This is a chord. Oh, that's a chord. No, that's not your chorus, that's your chorus, and that's a change and blah blah. So we just moved it around and all of a sudden I'm starting to sing a song and I I'm like I, this actually sounds like a song um and he was really positive he's like yeah it is a song and and then we started playing it with the band and we did this sneaky thing where we didn't tell people it was my song he just said it was a new song and we just started playing it and we got we played it towards the very end and they're like what do you think about that and it's like well that was Ren's song and and they were all like what so so that was actually a very cool moment in time as you can imagine <laughs> Um, and then, it, it, honestly, I had the right people around me at the time and a lot of encouragement and it just, the floodgates were open and I just haven't, haven't really stopped since that point. Yeah, it's interesting that you, yeah, there was obviously something unlocked when you were sitting in that car, the stereo was yeah. broken, you sort of yeah. tapped into something that, that had been in there yeah. the whole time, but obviously yeah. you hadn't had the channel to express it. Yeah, exactly. It is interesting. I don't know if you're the same, but I have this thing where I'm driving around places and all of a sudden I'll just start singing a song 
and be like, why am I singing this song? And I realized, ah, every time I come past this place, I sing the same song. Oh. Yeah. And I've been doing that since I was a kid. Like I remember this, like was a driving around in Manly and listening to Mental as Anything. And every time I drive past like Fairlight High School, I'd go, if you leave me. <laughs> and, I, and it was like, back then I'm a bit so bizarre. But I do think that there's something about music and location and memory and all of those things are all tied up with each other in some way or another that I don't you, know. Particularly if you give yourself permission to let it come in. You were saying earlier when you were working on the album that you gave yourself the space for songs to come in. And that's such a critical part of the creative process. And, and in modern life, it's quite hard, I think, when there's some, this pr push to productivity, right? Like everyone has yeah. to all their time and be productive. But of course, nature abhors a vacuum. So if you do create the space, then things are likely to come in, like the driving around in, in and of itself can create the space. Yeah, yeah. It's it, it's actually, uh, yeah, I completely agree. I think circumstance made it like that for me in regards to this album, but I also had learned, I'd, I'd learned that a little bit beforehand because with the Hegarty's we'd put out, before we put out our album, we put out an EP and, you know, we'd rehearse all the songs that we we're going to put out. And at the very last minute I wrote a song called True to You, which was one of the best songs out of all of them. <laughs> and it was one of the last songs I'd only just written in time. And we were, we'd I'd only written it maybe a week or two before we went to the studio and, and actually put it on. And it was definitely one of the strongest of, of the, all of them. Um, and it's the only song I'm still playing, so I think that's indicative of it. Okay. Um, but, yeah, had I have had I have not opened the space, had created the space for that, to do that, that song would never have been recorded and probably would have never, never nothing would have ever happened to it. So I think I learned from that experience to go, you know, it's... Um, it, creativity doesn't have a have a, a schedule you know some people are great at it but I think the minute you put a parameter around something that you're trying to create you you instantly take away so much opportunity given that now that the album's out in the world are you creating more songs <laughs> to be honest I'm actually not which is bizarre I'm I've written two recent songs I'm not I just haven't I've I don't think I'm in the headspace for it yet. Um, I've written plenty. Of, I've written songs since the album, but I, I was thinking about this today. It's just I'm almost like I need to get to a certain point with all of this where I feel like I'm ready to, and I don't really feel like I'm ready to yet. I've written two songs since this. One of the most, which I'm gigging, and I, I think they're both good, and I really like them. One is called um, Dexies. <laughs> it's all about it's a real country. We, you know, it's a it's a country song. More about where I'm at now. It's a whole lot of fun, and I probably will end up. Um, if I'm going to release anything soon, I'm probably just release it as a single. And I've written a song called Django, which is about my dog that died earlier this year, and it's just too heartbreaking to even sing. So even though I know it's there, it's a it's going to be a beautiful song when I'm done with it. I can't actually can't actually sing it yet. So I'm waiting for I'm waiting for that moment to be able to have enough time between us to actually be able to bring it back to the band and start playing it. But that's going to be a beautiful song when it's done. And I am, I never, I never don't, I don't, I never stop trying. I'm always, you know, ideas will come to my mind or I'll play around with something. And I've, I've half written a few things, but nothing really that I'm, I have, I'm not really in that headspace at the moment, I think. Um, and I kind of in the past that you would have scared me, I think, because people are always frightened about um, material, not, you know, like this whole not being able to write stuff. But I've had I've had so many ups and downs in my songwriting time frame that I know that when I'm ready for it, when the when the when the, when the space around me is right, when I'm ready for it, then it will happen. <laughs> So you mentioned that you are gigging. Uh, if people want to see you perform live, are you playing somewhere regular regularly? No, I'm just getting the. I've just moved to Melbourne, so I moved to Melbourne a couple of years ago, but have just put together my lineup. So we we had about five or six gigs here this year, but we're just slowly building up. I've got a gig tomorrow at the Mary Creek Tavern. I'm supporting um, Nick Batterham, which will be fun, which will be nice. We're doing it as a trio mode, so piano, keys, and guitar. Um, and then we're looking to book more gigs, but I haven't really, I just got overwhelmed <laughs> and I need to, I, the album was full on, like, 
getting this album finally launched really just took it out of me, to be honest. Um, but I've got the band sounding gorgeous and all the, all the all the elements are there. I've just got to get out there and start booking some more gigs. But yeah, we'll be we'll be gigging again in no time. Well, you have plenty of great songs to play at those gigs. I could keep talking to you for ages because yeah. it's interesting, but I should wrap it up. Um, perhaps I'll get to talk to you again at some point in the future. Oh, but thank you. Ren, it's been so lovely to chat and I uh, hope people go out and enjoy the album and also look to see you play live if they're in Melbourne. Thank you for your time. Oh, my absolute pleasure. Thank you, Sophie.